It's sunset here in beautiful Miami Beach, Florida. You are in for a treat. This is our first podcast ever. Producer Andrew and I sit down in the studio for a rapid fire interview style podcast where we pick apart some questions from the comment section, from the DMs, going through my life on Wall Street, talking about iteration, what rich versus really rich is really about. It's a wild and crazy ride. If this is your first time here on YouTube, you follow my content on TikTok, Instagram, wherever. Don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss the updates. We're gonna be doing a lot more here. I think you're gonna learn a lot. Here we go. So today I was thinking we go into like finance a little bit more like deeper type of questions, yep. things that your audience would like more. So let's start off like this. What are the top three qualities needed to become a successful entrepreneur? So the three most important characteristics I think that you need to be a successful entrepreneur you need to fail fast and you need to learn from your mistakes. Like that's number one. Number two is you need to become a huge reader. The reading is like a complete hack to getting like to downloading other people's mistakes and learning from those without you having to do it yourself. Yeah. And I think number three is build systems around yourself because you can't do it all the time for yourself. You have to have good people around you. You have to have good systems. That's what's going to carry the weight in the long run. The first couple months, the first couple years, you're going to be breaking your back, it's blood, sweat, and tears. Like, you, you know, you read about the stereotype of the entrepreneur. It's real, right? After that, you need to start to build some strong systems, start to enlist some smart people to help you out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a long journey if you're on your own. Through, like, networking and things like that. When we talk about networking, we, we talked about this last time. The way I see networking is I see it's you adding value to someone else, and if you're lucky, you get something back. That's what networking is to me. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think about networking is as they walk into a room and they're like, okay, what am I going to get out of these guys here today? Whereas that just doesn't work. Nobody wants to work with you, okay, unless they see value. Mm -hmm. If they see value, they're going to want to work with you. And oops, they might accidentally give some value back to you as a result. It's magic like yeah. that. How do you deal with uh, skepticism and criticism from others as, as well as self-doubt? Yeah. So criticism from others is important because it's more information. So if you are receiving criticism, it's best to take a second and say, hey, does this make any sense? Maybe it is something that I could improve. I think as, you know, as humans, we have the knee-jerk reaction to just jump in and say, let me defend myself. But defending yourself, I don't know if that's helping you make any progress, mm -hmm. especially if, if the criticism is accurate or coming from someone you like and care about or at least appreciate their opinion. You know, in the world of creating content online, you have a ton of criticism. What I would say is a small percentage of it is very important to listen to and a large percentage of it is noise and it is, is what we call trolling and this kind of thing <laughs> that we see online. How do you know which one to uh, digest and the other to like push away i think you need to pay attention to the way it's delivered i think there are a lot of people out there that want to help help you and they want to see you succeed so if they see you overstepping your your boundaries or you're making some mistakes with your content or you're not delivering the message the way that it's that it's sort of best could be received by the audience they're going to let you know okay um and then there's some people that just want to <laughs> ruffle some feathers and yeah. that's okay i started this week was very interesting for me because I was able to speak one-on-one -on -one with probably one of my biggest critics. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have this conversation with, with him because I said, hey man, maybe you're right. Maybe there's something about your criticism of, of my message that's right. And I wanted to learn from him because if I wasn't delivering my message clearly enough about what rich versus really rich is, about who I am as a guy, what, like, you know, what I stand for, my values, then man, I've got some work to do because if I'm creating an army of people that, that think something different about me, I, it's my charge to get up and, and fix that and yeah. to clarify that. Yeah, exactly. So that was interesting. So can you go more in depth with that story on like what exactly he mm -hmm. told you you were doing wrong? It's when you when you face online criticism, it's not often a matter of right or wrong. It's more of a matter of how they're interpreting your message. Yeah. In our little world of short form 30 second videos, let's just say that there's a lot of room for interpretation, right? There's there's very little depth that you can do in 15 to 30 seconds. Therefore, sometimes the message just gets lost. And if someone's pre predisposed to seeing it a different way, 
I don't know, can you blame them? They see their truth and, and that's what they see and they reinforce it. And Lord knows there's enough other people online to help them believe in that message, whether or not it's my message or my beliefs at all. I think for me, when I face criticism, especially if it's from a really big person, a big account, a well-known person, an influential person, the knee-jerk reaction is human. It's to get mad. It's to get like, oh, God, here we go again. You know, yeah. what's this guy's problem? And then what I've trained myself to do over the years, and it's years, plural, is take the deep breath, slow down, and determine if there's anything valuable there. And if there's something valuable there, challenges and struggle and chaos, it's better to run towards it than mm -hmm. away from it. Mm -hmm. When you run away from chaos and you run away from your critics, they get meaner and louder and noisier. Why do you see? <laughs> why do you think so many uh, people out here are so arrogant and just like throw everyone else's opinions out the window and always think they're the right ones? I think it's really hard to be self-reflective. I think it's really hard to admit that when you're wrong, it's not something that I'm great at I have to work at it every single day it's the natural human instinct is for protection and for survival mm -hmm. so when your ideas come to battle you want yours to win even if you have a doubt yeah. that it might you know not even be true mm -hmm. so certainly when it comes to bat with these online discussions you're, you're dealing with a wide variety of maturity levels a mm -hmm. wide variety of yeah. ages and experience exactly I agree 100% what do you think is like the number one mistake most business owners make? Well, for me, the mistakes that I've made have always been optimizing for a dollar amount for my business and not optimizing for my lifestyle. So I say, hey, I want to make 100 grand a month. Okay, I can optimize towards that. I sell 10 things to 10 people for 10,000 bucks a month. There's your 100 grand a month, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is I didn't say, well, I want to protect the quality of my life. Maybe I don't want to take meetings from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week, right? So business owners build this trap for themselves where they say, I want X amount of money or I want this house or I want this Ferrari, or, I want this Lamborghini. And they never say, I want to be able to go to bed at night without s sweating from stress, you know, yeah. or without a headache from customer complaints or whatever, clients calling you around the clock to put out fires. Mm -hmm. So I built a business that ultimately produced that number for me, that magic number, which was 100 grand a month. Okay, so I got the number, and when you hit a goal, you should you should feel like you've achieved something, yeah. right? The problem with me was, I was miserable. I built something that was a business that was taking over my life. I had no other way to enjoy my life, I had no personal time, and it's not like there was a way out. I built it, and that was it. Mm -hmm. There was no solution for handing over the business. There was no solution for selling the business. There was no solution for putting in um, talented operators. You know, the business was built on me and my skill set. So I was ir irreplaceable. Yeah, exactly. It was, a, it was a flaw from the beginning. So new business owners, it all starts in the beginning, the mapping out of your business, what's called begin with the end. Basically, what that means is start with that end in mind, and it better be deeper and more sophisticated than just a damn dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if you go beyond the dollar amount, you start to eliminate different things. You go, okay, you know, 100 grand a month, that's cool, but I also want to have peace of mind. I want to be able to, you know, go to all my kids' soccer practices, yeah, whatever exactly. it is. Like, you'll eliminate options. There's whole careers that you have to eliminate when you start to think that way, okay? You want to be able to go to every single one of your kids' practices. You want to be able to take off weekends. Don't become an investment banker. You can't do it, right? So this thing, this this idea of begin with the end, which was coined, I think, by Keller, who's founded Keller Williams Real Estate, the huge brokerage, billion-dollar brokerage. This is that begin with the end mindset. Is it start at the end? I think it might be start at the end. Mm -hmm. For me, that's absolutely critical. If I were to start everything I do at the end, I would have avoided so many headaches in my life. So start with the end uh, lifestyle in mind and just build around that kind of? Descriptive as you can. If you are starting your business at the end state, you want to make it extremely descriptive. You want to make it extremely detailed, make it feel alive because you'll know very clearly in that little innocent brainstorming session with you and your notebook, you haven't spent a cent mm -hmm. on anything, whether the business is being built in the right direction or not. Okay. Do you think a recession's coming? I think financial markets are already rebounding. Mm -hmm. um, I have two reasons for that. If you look at the 200-day moving average in S&P 500, 
it just bounced off of that like concrete and the bear market has lasted over i think 380 days so on the technical analysis side that's that's the statistical side it looks like it's over financial mm -hmm. market wise now what does that mean for the average american i think we're due for a, a rocky couple years because right now what's happening is inflation is still carrying on and most people's salaries haven't increased so that means that they're getting poorer mm -hmm. right they're getting paid x amount an hour that hasn't changed certainly hasn't increased 20 percent yeah right while the price of food gas just continues to increase the word recession is so loaded and self-fulfilling mm -hmm. it's like who cares it's like times are either booming in growth and expansion or times are contracting mm -hmm. That's how this goes. That's how, the, how this whole world game market, you know, global economy yeah. thing works. Recession is just a word, and the problem is w when recession becomes a state of mind, mm -hmm. because then you start to get nervous and limited and competitive yeah. and scared. It, don't you think that's what's happening though? Right now, they're all everyone or the, the media is trying to push everyone to be scared, to be, oh my God, what do I do next? What are you gonna do about that? Like. What do you think the average person should do about that? I think there's a difference between what I'm going to do as a business owner and the average person that might not be a business mm -hmm. owner. So if you're a, in a recessionary environment as a business owner, there's just plenty of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So as an owner, there's opportunity to buy things cheaper, whatever financial assets, mm -hmm. you can buy those cheaper now. There's opportunities to advertise and market your product cheaper. Yeah. Okay. And there's also tons of people going out of business. And there's talent that don't have jobs that would love to work with yeah, you yeah. if you're you have a great company exactly so these contractionary environments are really great for the prepared business owner the only way out of this for someone that has a traditional job that goes to work their paycheck doesn't fluctuate like crazy like mine does mm -hmm. right what they can do is cut back that's painful yeah because they don't have a lever to immediately increase their income but what they do have is they can reduce their consumption. That sucks. Like mm -hmm. most people, only 15% of America are entrepreneurs. Yeah. So most people should be cutting in preparation and just adjusting for the cost of products and, mm -hmm. and inflation. You can't consume at the same rate you that you have. To. Yeah. It's just simple math. Things are going up 15, 20% year over year. Well, you, you got to cut back mm -hmm. or you got to go out and get that side hustle and earn a lot yeah. more money. Let's not forget about that. Everyone has the capacity to, to go out and earn more money, mm -hmm. period. Everyone has the capacity to do that, but not everyone wants to do that. Yeah, no, most people are lazy. Well, it's, it's not that they're lazy. They have time constraints. They have different, they have different aspects of their life. They can't leave the house. They've got a young kid mm. at home, whatever it is. The way that I see it is you have the option available to you. Doesn't mean you're going to take it, but if you don't take it, slow the spending down. Okay, because your credit card bill, what's happening there? The interest rate is increasing. Mm -hmm. So if you're hoping that to just shove off these expenses on your credit card at a rising, rapidly rising interest rate, you're literally playing with fire. There is no way to win. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people who run up huge credit card debt, especially around the holidays, when you're putting things on your credit card, you better be planning to pay that credit card off at the end of the cycle. If you can't, it's going to be very hard for you to pay it off, period. And this is how a lot of people end up with a mountain of debt. To get out of a mountain of debt, you need to, at some point in your future, have a massive increase in your income. Most people don't have that opportunity because they're not business owners, they're not investors, they're not, they're, there's no option for them to just jump 20, 30, 50, yeah. 100%, right? Mm -hmm. It's available to them, but most people don't have that embedded optionality, right, that a business owner might. It's important to know what tools you have at your disposal. The average American has cutting their spending and then taking on additional work, taking on a second job, doing a side hustle, creating a business from, from their kitchen, from their basement, from their, you know, whatever, yeah. their garage. That's available to everyone. But that's a tough option, and there's a lot of risk and, and questions involved. So For the younger guys out there <clears throat> in, like, their early 20s, like, how do you um, tell them, like, to make that risk or to push push in the younger ages because you don't get like you said time constraints later in life like what advice could you give in that sense yeah like, when you're young you can take more risk there's no one depending on you mm -hmm. right so you can take more risk you have more time statistically than a 60 year old guy right and therefore you have more options 
you can play around and the stakes are a lot lower. Also, you're young, you're able-bodied. If things go wrong, you can bounce back a lot quicker. Yeah. From an emotional level too, you're learning. So the more trouble you get yourself into, the better. Mm-hmm. Not, not legal trouble. Like yeah. the more business failures and Just iterations lessons. you go through, the better. Mm-hmm. And gather those as quickly as possible. I worked it in a traditional role at an investment bank as a trader. I made my own share of mistakes in that role, but if I had been on my own as an entrepreneur, or a junior entrepreneur, or a tinkerer, I would have have had an opportunity to make a heck of a lot more mistakes at a younger age. And uh, if there's anything I regret about going to Wall Street, it, it would be that. I mm-hmm. wish I had a wider variety of mistakes I could have made out in the wild, you know. I got you. What is your opinion on cryptocurrency and where do you think it's headed? I think crypto just took three years back step because fundamentally the distrust is now as baked in as it could could ever be from ftx from ftx there's this idea called contagion the idea is when there's a market that's so closely tied together literally interwoven that Mm -hmm. when one big thing breaks it drags everything else down with it so what we're seeing is a crazy amount of contagion in crypto where all these safe places you find out that you were just standing in a field in a lightning storm the whole time, right? You just were like, oh, I'm not standing by that tree. It's like, well, it's still a lightning storm. Yeah. You know, so people are realizing truly how risky crypto is. Crypto was never safe to begin with, Mm -hmm. but you're supposed to have known that. Yeah. (laughs) It's a risky asset. It's a levered bet on stocks, meaning it's more volatile than the stock market, Mm -hmm. which is the risk assets. I got you. What do you think of what happened with FTX? What is your opinion on that? I think it's too bad because I think FTX had a chance to be that blue chip company Mm -hmm. and to keep crypto clean in the eyes of regulators, in the eyes of of, of folks that are using it for the right reasons. The investment in technology in crypto has been absolutely amazing, and I think there's going to be great use cases eventually. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is this is squashed innovation. As money gets sucked out of crypto, innovation gets sucked out of of crypto and and web3 and all this all this stuff so personally crypto for me i don't have a lot of use cases for it Mm -hmm. i'm not the guy that says he has a lot of use cases for it however these new technologies should be able to float on their own what's happening now is that there's going to be a complete crackdown regulatory crackdown in the u.s at least and then you regulate the heck out of something you end up taking the utility (laughs) out of it altogether. okay the only people that are going to win in a highly regulated environment is the U.S. government and the exchanges. Not you, the investor or trader, if you think you're a trader, give up. Give up. You're mm-hmm. not going to win that game. I got you. What is your opinion on university? <laughs> you're laughing. You're like, I can't wait. I think the university diploma has been a depreciating asset for about 10 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people could say, well, that's easy for you to say. You you went to Cornell, you went to an Ivy League school, right? I know that it's depreciating because I went to an Ivy League school. <laughs> I was there. It wasn't that great, everybody. You know, so mm-hmm. I think when people are evaluating a degree or, or st- sticking with it or dropping out, right, you need to determine where your education is coming from, where where your wisdom is coming from. Because my argument is wisdom comes from the real world. Okay, education can come from a book. It gets you close. Right. But it's like reading a book on snowboarding Mm -hmm. and then pulling up to the mountain and going, all right, you know, I'm going to hang out with Sean White now in the half pipe. Good luck. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Not a chance. You could read as many books and take as many courses and go to the snowboarding seminar of America and you're still going to, you know, exactly. You have to do it. You're still going to eat shit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that 100 percent because I I just find a lot of kids nowadays just. They're going to college and they don't really care about education. A lot of people I know, especially, they just go there to have fun. They just Mm want to just, they just love the freedom aspect about it. And then they get out of school and they have to join the big pack, like what everyone else does. Right. Traditional American college and universities is a rigged, fixed game because when you're young, you should be experimenting with all of the options professionally at your, at your disposal, but actually going and doing Mm -hmm. them. Right. You want to work. You want to be a lawyer. Go help out at a law firm. You you want to work in as an engineer, an architect. Go join an engineering and architecture firm. Go actually do it and work for free. Mm-hmm. Because guess what? You're paying for the diploma anyway. You're paying to sit there. Why not exactly. just do it for free? Exactly. Like you said, a lot of people get inter- internships 
like in their few years into college, imagine if people got to do those things in middle school, how far the world probably would be in the future. Yeah. I understand the value of having a breadth of education, mm -hmm. right? Like for me, that was very important to be exposed to a wide variety of things, right? But at some point, when do we start to specialize? Mm -hmm. I was ready to specialize when I was a lot younger than, you know, college instructs you mm -hmm. to. College is this funny thing. It's like at the end of this four years, when you're practically an adult, you'll know what you want to do. It's like, <laughs> I kind of knew what I wanted to do before that. But mm -hmm. then you guys just sort of confused me by yeah. make, making me take all these ridiculous courses I, di I didn't need to take. Mm -hmm. A particularly strange thing is um, finance and economics courses in, in a big, great university because they have oftentimes nothing to do with the actual process uh, on the street, Wall Street or whatever, when you go to the bank, right? That disconnect is really problematic to me because when I went to Wall Street, I had no clue what I was doing. I had the text, the textbook version of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the real version of Wall Street. And it turns out that those two things are completely <laughs> different. They're completely different, right? And Lord knows what you really don't want is the Hollywood version of whatever it is that you do. The, <laughs> the Hollywood version of being on Wall Street, the Hollywood version of being a lawyer. You know, you'd be watching Legally Blonde and thinking that that's going to be your foray, foray into law. Like Hollywood is going to set you up even worse than university is going to set la you la up land. for. <laughs> right. La La Land. <laughs> the Hollywood version of being a musician. It's a lot different than it is to really be a musician mm -hmm. than what you see you know, our boy Ryan Gosling yeah. doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you joined a frat, right? Yeah. How was that whole experience? Yeah. So this is comical, right? Because my joining my fraternity was the most real world version of my college experience. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hate that comes on to fraternities. And listen, there's guys that have done some crazy, stupid, horrible things. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I was focused on in my fraternity was like, wait, I get a budget. I get to plan an event. I get to run a business. Mm -hmm. It was the first time anyone entrusted me mm -hmm. with a budget and thousands of dollars. And the planning of all these parties are multivariable. Yeah. You know, sure, part of it's ordering a bunch of beer and making sure it yeah. shows up on time. But there's a lot of logistics and a lot of strategy and thinking. Wow. And man, that was, to me, the real world in college. Mm -hmm. You know, so fraternities are like, demonized you know like they're these evil institutions and like i said horrible things have happened there's there's no doubt about it but um and people have made some really stupid young people have made some really stupid choices but that gave me the springboard to taste a little bit of entrepreneurship autonomy budgeting accounting mm -hmm strategy all those good things in the real world yeah i agree with you in that sense i think that's great in that sense because it's obviously it's not the same thing as Wall Street or whatever, but it's kind of like the the blueprint of that kind of. And let's think about it this way. Okay. In a class, let's pretend you were taking an event planning 101. <laughs> and you go, okay, guys, uh, here's my final junior year presentation. Here's my senior year presentation for event planning 101. Here's my event that, you know, it's going to be at this hotel and these are the guests mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. What do you guys think? Uh, you, pretty good. You get a B plus. Okay, let's go back to the fraternity. I'm, I'm going to throw a real event at the fr fraternity house, right? Okay, so the beer doesn't show up on time. The other sorority doesn't remember the party. You know, uh, the band doesn't show up on time. What's going to happen? You're going to become a social outcast. <laughs> you mm -hmm. might even be removed from your post mm -hmm. as the social chair. You will be dethroned mm -hmm. from your post as social chair. There are real world consequences. And, and let me tell you right now, it's going to hurt a lot more screwing up that real world fraternity party, then it's gonna hurt getting a poor C or D in your event planning exactly. class. Exactly, exactly. So what was the worst uh, decision you ever made in your career? And what was the outcome of that? Yeah, I've made the same bad decision twice. I optimized for dollars two mm -hmm. times. I optimized for dollars when I went to Wall Street. I said, how do I get as rich as possible as quick as possible? Wall Street, right? Yeah. That's what that's what in my generation everyone ran to. Now it's tech, right? You'd you'd run to tech. And I'd argue that's a better thing to run to. It's a growing industry. It's way more varied and, and it's, there's way more potential and opportunity. It's limitless, right? Mm -hmm. Um and I did it again when I started my digital agency. I said, I want to make a hundred grand a month. How do I do that? Okay, we do that in six months. 
wait, I'm on the phone from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. with clients putting out fires. Nobody likes me. <laughs> I'm Mr. Yeah, everyone wants to scream at me, right? I built a, I built an unscalable model, and uh, I don't care how much money you're getting paid. If you're on the phone from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week, you're not spending much of it. If you got a l- little Ferrari, you got a little uh, 488, it's sitting in the, in the driveway, in the garage, and you're not even going to turn the key on it. Jesus. Well, you're not going to turn the key. You're not going to press yeah. the button in the ignition. Wow. So, Relationships, by the way, get hurt by mm-hmm. this. So if you're if you're a young entrepreneur who cares about a relationship, if you ever if you have a girlfriend, if you have a significant other, if you have a boyfriend, whatever it is, business is going to put pressure on that, and that's something you need to think about up front. Are you willing to sacrifice close relationships for your business? Mm-hmm. That's going to be a good one for uh, <laughs> for <is>. TikTok. <laughs> it is. Wait, so. Do we like how this is going today? Yeah. It's going okay? I think I think it's going fast-paced. A lot of valuable content's coming okay. from this. So who influenced you into banking? Two people. Gordon Gecko, who's a fictional character from Wall Street One, and a guy named Mark Fisher, who is a pit trader in the New York Mercantile Exchange, NYMEX, World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. This guy is an animal, okay? He's one of the largest natural gas and crude oil traders on the floor when it was open outcry. A total beast known only as fish to the locals down at the exchange. I went down to the World Trade Center when I was a sophomore in college. I didn't know much about anything other than trading was was pretty pretty cool. I'd seen the the videos. I'd read about Paul Tudor Jones, the legendary hedge fund manager. I get down to the I get down to the pit where where people are buying and selling things with open outcry. This before it went all to computers. Man, I saw twenty one year olds with $200,000 $200,000 complicated uh, Odomar's PK watches pulling out of the thing in Porsche turbos, wow. uh, 19-year-olds lo- winning and losing millions and millions of dollars day in and day out. I was like, well, this is what I want to do when I grow up. You know, the personality was rough, was brash. Not everyone was wearing some perfectly starched collar. People were rough. They were street. And that's what I liked about it. That's where I got my first taste a little bit of some really rich behavior Mm -hmm. where it's like, I don't care what you do. Like, are you good at your job? Are you efficient? Are you, are you a shark in the pit? Are you getting me a good price? So, uh, I got the bug seeing open outcry trading for the first time, uh, when I was a young, was a young guy and it stuck with me ever since. How old were you when you started, uh, like, I want to do this. I was 19. Wow. So yeah. right out of high school, freshman year in college. Fresh out of high school. You have to understand, Wall Street was super mainstream. It was a mm-hmm. mainstream thing to do in my group of friends. So I'm pretty sure almost every one of my friends in high school ended up going to Wall Street, whether it was on the trading floor or on wow. the banking side. That's just what we did. It was very popular for us to push our passions down. You know, for me, when I was growing mm-hmm. up, I was super into music. I was mm-hmm. super into art. I was super into writing. But that wasn't the thing to do. So I just kind of pushed that down. The thing is, if you push down your passions long enough and hard enough, man, you're creating a ticking time bomb for yourself. Mm-hmm. Because one day, yeah, when you least expect it, exactly. when you're in your perfect little house and your perfect apartment with everything just the way you thought you wanted it, it's going to erupt. Because you're going to eventually have to chase and go after your passion or you are going to die a bitter, bitter, bitter person. Exactly, and that's exactly what you did. What, eight years later, and yeah, that's when everything... Well, I was working on Wall Street. I was sitting in my perfect little apartment with my perfect girlfriend and my perfect life and all this stuff that I just couldn't stand anymore because I wasn't doing anything that made me happy or made me fulfilled. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one day I came home. I saw my girlfriend at the time. She was cooking she really didn't know how to cook so it was like it was (laughs) it was just this endearing thing i saw her trying to like cook and i felt man like you've got this domestic bliss unfolding before you you should be thankful you know and then i i was overwhelmed with this sense of gratitude and and we sat down to dinner and i was eating whatever she was making it wasn't very good (laughs) and she said you know you know what you need nick and i said uh i don't need anything i'm the happiest guy in the world right my beautiful girlfriend we're having this great dinner together you know sure i had Mm -hmm. a rough day but who cares Mm -hmm. this is how it goes this is part of being a guy this part of being alive in america you know you got to suffer we've got the money everything's good And she said you know what you need new steak knives these are terrible cheap and uh i knew that i had to leave at that point really yeah 
how did you optimize for mental health like through all of this mental health for me takes care of itself when you're doing stuff you care about mm -hmm. and you listen because by the way you're not going to care about the same thing forever it's okay if one year you care about painting and the next you want to do sculpture whatever it is right you have to listen to yourself and you have to pay attention to your passion also this is critical you have to pay attention to the market meaning feedback from other people mm -hmm. right are they buying your products are they cheering you on you know you can decide to do anything you want in life but it doesn't mean you're going to get paid for it and rewarded for it the market the world tells you what they want from you mm -hmm. it's your goal to play and try different things and find that that mix of something you like and something you're rewarded for mm -hmm. i don't believe in the environment now don't bring up vincent van gogh or some of these great artists who didn't enjoy a lot of success and love in their lives and thank god that we had a vincent van gogh but for most people most people aren't vincent vincent van gogh we need to find a mix of passion and getting rewarded for our value that we add in our lifetime mm -hmm. um and when we can do that man things are things are pretty awesome yeah so patience there's a difference between patience and banging your head against the wall i got you why do you think when we're younger, we're always told to like push our passions down and not go for them and just follow that one way road that everyone goes instead of just going the other way? I think people, I think parents are more risk averse than you are the individual. Parents want what's best for you and what's great for you, right? So a well-worn path of being a doctor, a lawyer, whatever you want, pick your, mm -hmm. pick your well-worn path, going to Wall Street, well-worn path, right? It's a surefire way that you're going to have a roof over your head, food on the table, right? You're going to take your one vacation every year. It's a surefire way that your you're parents gonna okay. know you're going to be okay. Now we start to move into higher risk, higher reward scenarios. Mm -hmm. You know, by the way, being an artist for a lot of people isn't very lucrative, but for some people it's fabulously lucrative. I know a few artists who are extremely wealthy and successful. I know a few artists who aren't so wealthy and successful. Mm. So when you go into these highly leveraged environments like entrepreneurship, yeah, there's environments where it doesn't work out. My argument is if you're really smart, you're going to keep iterating and keep, you know, dialing it in, you know, until it gets just right. And that's when you doing what you love and you're getting rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. And you're not getting rewarded for it because you're some like a thief or a crook or mm -hmm. you're manipulating society or some some bullshit. You're getting rewarded for it because you're like, this is providing value and I like to do it. Oh, that's the magic right there. So how how does it work like consistency and being um, just persistent and how do you know when to keep going or when to just go do something else or maybe try a different road? How do you know when to change the path i think you need to show up to work every day and showing up to work might mean i'm going to try something new today i'm just going to try a little something different if it's not working and every single day you show up and you make that tweak that iteration right mm -hmm. and eventually okay you're going to learn from it i got you. because it's built into our dna like we're chasing the good stuff and we're staying away from the bad stuff so those failures you're going to remember them mm -hmm. and those good things you're going to say oh, i want more of that you know, you open up your e-commerce store, nothing sells, nothing sells. Okay, I don't know if people want hats. Let me try sweatshirts. You open up, you know, you change it, you tweak it, you build some cool designs. Oh man, I just sold two two sweatshirts. Mm -hmm. You know, look, start to feel a little rush, start to feel a little excitement. Okay, let's chase this. Yeah. We're headed in the right direction now. Okay, I got you. What's the difference between a, a winner mindset and a loser mindset in your eyes? Stopping. Um, quitting quitting that's it because this is the best part about being a human we are all exactly equal it's just where we are in the timeline you know you might be here you might be a few more mistakes away from getting exactly whatever it is that you want that's why I can't ever look down on you I'm just maybe over here a little further in my timeline mm -hmm. my mistake I've just made a few more mistakes than you have <laughs> and so I'm a little bit further so never look down on someone else there are a few more mistakes away from where you are your lofty magical <laughs> place right uh if you stop then the game's over mm -hmm. you know no yeah. more quarters in the arcade machine the game's over that is the only way you lose 
I agree with that 100%. Why do you think so many people just stop? Like, why? Because it's hard and it's scary and it's emotionally draining. And it's easier to stop sometimes when you have another option. Here's the ultimate trick to getting what you want. Don't give yourself another option. You don't want to eat cookies? Don't put cookies in the house. Yeah. You don't want to watch TV? Take the freaking TV off the wall. Yeah, I agree because you see like, oh, your parents or my parents, especially other people are like, you need to have a plan B. Like, what if it doesn't? They're always trying to Mm -hmm. push that. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, a plan B is the plan that you will take when things get a little tough. Mm -hmm. A plan B is the most overrated thing in the entire Mm -hmm. world. I don't have a plan B. I haven't had a plan B in a long time because my plan A keeps changing and keeps getting more interesting. I don't need a plan B. My plan A is is what I'm I'm iterating mm-hmm. on and chasing around and having fun with. I My plan you. A has to be exciting and fun and rewarding. Mm-hmm. What is your opinion on uh, like leaving your hometown versus uh, staying in it in the sense when you're younger and the people in your hometown see you in a specific way? Like, how do you? Uh, what do you think of that? Like, do you have to leave that place to for you to be able to grow or? What happens when you travel, what happens when you leave home, your hometown is perspective. Mm-hmm. So perspective is knowledge and it's a, it's, it's a deep form of knowledge. Perspective is really wisdom, okay? Because you show up in Amsterdam for the first time. You're in Amsterdam. You're making contact with Amsterdam, right? Whether you're being a good boy or a bad boy in mm-hmm. Amsterdam, that's not the question. The, the most important thing is when you leave your hometown, you can't help but learn you can't help but learn about yourself and learn from new people. Mm-hmm. So listen, po- the popular move back in the day was I'm going to New York, right? Because what New York did was New York knocked you over the head with diversity, with diversity of opinion, diverse, diversity of culture, right? If you come from a small town, maybe everyone's just like you. So you go to New York and everyone just isn't like you. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what's the beauty of meeting a lot of people that aren't like you? You can learn from them. Okay, and you start to build a better map of the way that the world works. You start to build a better map of reality, a deeper, more detailed map. That Mm -hmm. makes you a smarter, way, way, way more dangerous business person, entrepreneur, friend, lover, whatever it is that you're going after. I got you. And ultimately, it makes you a better son because it makes you a stronger person. Anyone who has more perspective ultimately becomes more stronger, not in a sense of like brute force, but in a, in a sense of flexibility. Like, hey, I've seen that before. It's not that big of a deal. I got you. I've hung out with those people before. They're pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Because everyone is th- th- cool and is the same when you when you get down to it. It's just about seeing it for yourself. Yeah, I understand. I saw on one of your newsletters you mentioned something about uh, psychedelics, like global. What do you think of that? I think that psychedelics are just another tool that we have been afraid to explore. And what we're finding is they're not that dangerous and they might be a lot more helpful than they are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's interesting because what it appears that psychedelics are doing is it's removing the barrier of new information, right? So as someone who every day tries to be open-minded, it's not easy to be open-minded. So if there's an experience using some either a chemical or using a natural plant or sub, some kind of substance when it's legal and, and, through, and through the proper channels, mm-hmm. et cetera, if this is a tool to open your mind to new information and to take in new information, well, then you've just got a cheat code to the fucking universe. You've basically said, oh, my belief is open-mindedness is a core characteristic of becoming successful. So if you have a strategy or a ritual or a plant or a fungus that can make you more open-minded when you need it most, that, my friend, is a powerful tool. Not a powerful tool for going out and listening Mm -hmm. to music in a field. It's a powerful tool for becoming more successful and becoming closer to who you want to be as a person. Mm -hmm. And ultimately becoming, I think, closer to other people who you don't know yet. You realize how similar we all are. Mm -hmm. And to go even deeper, how similar we all are to animals and plants and the ecosystem if we want to keep going deep into that yeah. that mindset i agree how was life growing up as a kid tough because when i grew up i had that perfect childhood until i was about seven and then it just went 
horribly wrong. My parents split up. We moved to a different place. We lost our old friends. And it was like this rebuilding start over mm -hmm. process for me. I had to go from one house to another, have carry my lacrosse stick from my mom's house to my dad's house, trying not to forget anything. It was just this chaotic moment in my life. I think it made me hyper aware and vigilant that things are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. When your parents split up and your parents get divorced, you take extra caution to make sure what you're working on doesn't just blow up or break apart like that did. So hyper aware, hyper vigilant. I have to be careful that that doesn't become a sense of fear or doesn't become malignant, but mm -hmm. it's definitely made me a person that is always paying attention, appreciative of what I have, and under the impression that nothing is permanent. I understand. So going into fear, what do you think? Uh, do you have fear? Or do you think fear is a good thing? What is your, like, how do you deal with that? I used to wear those no fear t-shirts when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think fear can be a motivator, but it's not the right motivator. Fear pushes me out of bed sometimes because they say, hey, if you don't go to work today, this whole thing could crumble. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole thing that you've built could be just a house of cards if you don't show up for work today. That's one motivational strategy. I don't know if it's the best. Let's try another one. I get out of bed because they say, I can do anything I want today. Mm -hmm. I can experiment. I can play around. And hey, maybe one of these crazy things that I do ends up becoming the next big thing that pushes me to the next level. Okay. So I think we have a choice. We could be driven by fear. We could be driven by creativity and exploration, adventure, right? What's the definition of an adventure? Traveling into the unknown, right? The unknown could be scary mm -hmm. on the negative, or the unknown could be absolutely life-changing. Yeah. You know? So if you're an explorer, right, you're, you're coming over uh, on a ship, right? You're, you're like, yeah, this is a little scary mm -hmm. because I might just fall off the end of this flat world if that turns out to be true, right? Wouldn't that suck? Yeah. Uh, or I find the gold and the treasure and all these great <laughs> things, right? So I think we wake up every morning like explorers. We can either be terrified that we're going to fall off the end of a cliff or ecstatic that we're going to find the treasure and find that our dream come true life. You know, just a few more steps, just a few more phone calls, just a few more TikToks, just a few more mm -hmm. emails. Why do so many people choose the comfortable route more than the uncomfortable route? To protect yourself. I think we get protect comfortable. Protect yourself from what? I think the unknown can be viewed to those two ways. The unknown could be scary and the unknown could be incredible. And I think some people have a really hard time making that hop from the scary to the incredible. Mm -hmm. But like, why do so many people rather just stay in the same place their, their whole lives? I think if you're staying in the same place your whole life, you're paralyzed by some kind of fear that you have for what's work gonna work out or what's not gonna work out. Maybe you're being pressured and there's some outside influences, but it's a complex mix of, mm -hmm. of reasons. I also don't judge people that stay where they are because we're humans, man. Everyone's different. Like, mm -hmm. so. I'm not saying everyone needs to go up and go build yeah. a business and open up this, a car wash or whatever it is. Take it's the like, leap of faith. Take the leap of faith. It's, it's not something that everyone has to do. What I think everyone has to do is provide some kind of value. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you can sit on the couch and be a couch potato. This is where I differ. This is really important. This is where I differ from Ray Dalio, who's a huge uh, fan. He's what I call my mentor from a distance. I read all his, all his work. I follow his work, mm -hmm. et cetera. Ray Dalio says, hey, you want to be a couch potato? No problem. I differ with that. I differ there. I think as humans, we need to wake up and we need to do something that helps everyone else out. Mm -hmm. We're so interconnected. You being a couch potato, it's stealing a little bit of my day away from me. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be a couch potato, watch that great movie and participate in culture. That's great. But what are you adding? You've got to add something. And, and by the way, everyone can add something to the mm -hmm. puzzle to the fabric of humanity everyone can add something to the fabric of human humanity yeah, I agree. how did you develop fast outreach so fast outreach is the perfect example of beginning with the end because what i have is a large audience of people that are interested in entrepreneurship finance right they're building their own businesses so fast outreach is an expression of how to help people grow their businesses mm -hmm. by doing outreach using ai at scale if you're into cold emailing, you're into this sort of outreach world, you can't send someone a template email and expect a response in, in 2022, right? So the idea here is what fast outreach does is it allows you to personalize at scale to grow faster to get more responses. That's a powerful tool for a lot of people 
that are listening to my message and, and following what I do, right? In fact, what I made a decision to do and what really what I made a decision not to do is sell t-shirts and caps and these things that are cool, mm -hmm. cool to wear, right? But if I'm gonna spend a year of my life building something, what's gonna help you more? Me giving you a t-shirt <laughs> or me giving you a piece of software that allows you to grow your business? Yeah. No, I get that. That website is completely different from what everyone else is doing, especially as a content creator slash entrepreneur slash experience everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's some value that not really anyone else can provide. But what is your secret to becoming a top 1% man in this? On OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> what is your secret to becoming a top 1% man in the world? I don't know if I'm a top 1% man in the world. I'm, or, I'm, I, I think I'm, you get what I mean. <laughs> I, I think I'm I think I'm pretty good at a couple different things mm -hmm. and that adds up to this little secret recipe. So there's this whole idea called combinatrix. Mm -hmm. It's basically the power of combining disparate skills together to create something that is literally a snowflake. Mm -hmm. Like okay, so let's give a couple examples here, all right? I play guitar. Okay, I'm not Jimi Hendrix, right? But I play guitar, right? So let's say I'm 20% guitar in the 20 percentile okay i'm an entrepreneur not steve jobs right but let's say i'm in the 20 percent again okay fine let's say i'm a comedian an online comedian let's say i make funny videos online i'm not the funniest guy on tiktok right let's say i'm in the 20 percent now what's 20 percent times 20 percent times 20 percent now we've got our very unique combination mm -hmm. of skills where very few people out there are guitarists comedians and uh, yeah, entrepreneurs exactly how do you go about uh learning all these skills because you can't do it like all at the same time or can you this is the beauty i think of about what people can learn when they see people having success in business and social media you already have these skills you've been building them your whole life just look down and write it down oh i play piano oh, i play tennis mm. okay i'm the tennis playing piano player yeah let's add one more what else do i like oh and uh i'm like a great sprinter okay i'm the tennis playing sprinting piano player well let me tell you my friend there's probably only one of you out there and a lot of people want to hear from you mm -hmm. because guess what you're fun and unique as as you are, but you're even more exciting to the tennis pros and the runners yeah. and the piano players. You've created this recipe for just being highly interesting. The joy here is bring anyone into the room. I want to meet them. Let's find, well, let's find their three skills yeah. and give them a camera and let them combine those things and talk about it. That piece of advice right there is is a, a something that a lot of people don't like see and everyone has. So it's it's crazy to think like how so many people think they don't have anything, but they probably have three, four, or five different things. I think people see themselves as the individual pieces as opposed to the whole. Mm -hmm. Because you see yourself, oh, I'm okay at this. I'm okay at guitar. Oh, I'm okay at tennis. Okay, but not that's not how the world sees you. The world sees you as a combination of all these assets, mm -hmm. and that makes you incredibly unique. So you're sitting there picking apart, well, I'm only 30% here, 20% here. Okay, man, but there's not many people like you that have all of these things in the same basket. Yeah. And that's where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. And also, that's where your your upbringing and your cultural background gets interesting, mm -hmm. too. You know? Exactly. Let's say you're the French-speaking tennis player. You know, man, just keep making it more and more interesting. Mm -hmm. Whether you grew up poor, whether you grew up rich, keep making it more interesting all the way like plug all the pieces together until until it's an like arrow point one. yeah mm -hmm. until it's a, a freaking arrow point where exactly. you're the only one that just cuts through the noise and the beauty of technology is back in pre-internet times which isn't that long ago being the tennis playing french speaking piano player was pretty cool in your local community yeah now with the power of the internet now with the power of frictionless media now with the power of free media man you are a superstar exactly. overnight exactly. and everyone is waiting to hear from you mm -hmm. how do you deal with trauma in your life even from like from your kid days like you said to now is it the same way you've or have you grown to go about it differently i try to use it for good and i try to explore it in my work mm -hmm. i think that there's been a lot of good things that have happened to me and a lot of bad things that have happened to me but those bad things are kind of like wait and see some of some of these traumas as we're calling them like this might be something that propels you or causes you to be more caring or more cautious or more introspective or more interested in other mm -hmm. people 
these things that on the surface level, we, we say, man, that's horrible that that happened to me. But we look at some of the greatest artists, some of the greatest musicians, some of the greatest business people in the world, and everyone's had mm -hmm. a turbulent upbringing. Not everyone's had a turbulent. Plenty of these people have had a turbulent upbringing, mm -hmm. and it's allowed them to squeeze out some just incredible and and creativity into the world. So I'm thankful for all the crazy shit that I've had to deal with. I'm thankful for the blow ups. I'm thankful for the mistakes because the more that we go through, we're like an old tree, you know, we're, we're like a tree that's weathered that mm -hmm. storm, this storm. It's like, well, who's the strongest tree? The tree that's still standing. So I'm still standing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think trauma like pushes you to the next level to be successful? You need trauma or nightmare? I don't I don't think anyone needs what we're saying is trauma which I'm I'm coming to believe is maybe a deep emotional wound mm -hmm. right I think everyone needs challenge, challenge and stress stress because without stress you're not going to get strong without stress you're not going to learn mm -hmm. I think there's a problem where that stress becomes too much and it starts to break you down and weather you down it's just like working out mm -hmm. if you work out every single day three times a day eventually you're going to start to yeah. burn out your muscles and you're going to go into an overtraining state mm -hmm. right but if you work out and you rest and you work out and you rest you know that's how you get to the schwarzenegger t territory right <laughs> yeah you need that recovery baked in what's funny is if you you, ha you ever go through these old bodybuilding documentaries is a famous one called pumping iron mm -hmm. arnold schwarzenegger is literally at the top of his game right and you just watch him through the documentary and you wouldn't think he's this absolutely fastidious fitness legend what you think is he's kind of like this lazy trickster <laughs> you see him sleeping on the beach you see him occasionally training you see mm -hmm. him messing around the gym it, because what you're seeing in the documentary is how much every aspect is important to him the training and the rest mm -hmm. and the enjoyment and the goofing around and the mental state you see a very very well-rounded athlete okay. in these old documentaries mm -hmm. And you see him pitted against Lou Ferrigno, who is his, his biggest adversary mm -hmm. from the U.S., known as the Incredible Hulk, right? So Lou Ferrigno was, in a sense, just as powerful and just as, as competitive, but he had a lot more rigidity. He had to sleep in the perfect time. He had to eat the perfect thing. And it made him more fragile in mm -hmm. the long run. And it's mindset. I got to, th you know, you could see it in the documentary. And Schwarzenegger would just pick on this because he knew that he was wrapped so tightly that if one screw fell out, the whole, <laughs> yeah. you know, the whole machine would just come tumbling down. So I don't know how we, how I got into that. <laughs> that <was> <laughs> how do you, um, when you first started posting on social media, how did you, deal with the hate comments or you never really cared all these comments like you read them if anyone tells you that they don't read them i don't think they're doing a great job mm -hmm. on social media because you need to be paying attention to feedback mm -hmm. feedback is what guides what guides you again the right kind of feedback because mm -hmm. there's a lot a lot of noise that's coming through the comment boxes right mm -hmm. so you need to have an initial response from a good chunk of people to know you're on the right direction then you just need to believe in your vision I there's there's that. people that want to break down great shit mm -hmm. all the time and you just have to understand it are they trying to break it down for the wrong reasons or is it time to make maybe make a shift mm -hmm. here's the problem okay the internet comment is a really lazy way of providing criticism, yeah. right? So it's low quality criticism. It's criticism, mm -hmm. but it's low quality. So you need to judge it fairly. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, is this interesting or no? And move on. Yeah. You know, because it's anonymous. It takes two exactly. seconds. They're never going to see me. And like these people that are probably typing aren't really doing much anyway. So think about taking the time out of your day to tell mm -hmm. someone else that they suck yeah like <laughs> that you don't know yeah and, and who their, didn't just cut you off their in their profile car. picture is like a spider-man or right. something the anonymity of the comment section is good and it's a curse because it's good that there's this freedom of discourse mm -hmm. but it's a curse because there's no skin in the game for the commenter so i lose because there's <laughs> someone said something about me but they don't lose anything because they delete the profile and create another one the next yeah. day with a cartoon head 
So this is something that we haven't figured out on social media yet. And this is a big problem because the more hate, the more vitriol, the more trolling that's going on, it actually lowers the experience for everyone. The creator, the, the mm -hmm. fans, like everyone just loses. And it's a small percentage of the people that can just create this feeling of just anger and resentment. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. And social platforms, I think, are trying to figure this out. Do you think it's like envious feelings, jealousy, or like, oh, I wish I was you type of thing? Or do you just think they really like just want to be like a hateful person? Uh, there's infinite ways to explain the world around you, right? So you can say, hey, everyone wakes up in the morning and wants to add a little bit of value and they go to work and they work hard and society gives them a paycheck. And, mm -hmm. You know, the company gives them a paycheck because the company sells a product that people want, yeah. whatever it is, right? Or they could say, you know what, people wake up in the morning and they're really just looking tr to try to screw over their their neighbor. So they wake up and they go to the office and they jockey for position and they try to get their buddy fired so they can get the raise. You could see the world in both of these lights. It's your choice, mm -hmm. right? So my choice is to look at it through a more positive, yeah. creative lens. And that's what my social media series is about. Mm -hmm. I'm basically arguing and playing this little game for, for everyone to see that this is the way I see the world working out best. Mm -hmm. So it's not the rich guy. It's not this how much money one guy has or the other guy has. It's this guy went through life thinking creatively, being humble, being collaborative. And slowly but surely, things just kind of worked out a little bit yeah. better for him. So through these skits, I'm showing you that you can walk two different paths in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've simplified it to the rich path and the really rich path. You could call it whatever you want. You could call it the jackass path <laughs> and the nice guy path. You call it whatever you want. Yeah. But for me, you have an option and that option costs nothing. Mm -hmm. And that option is available to you every single day. So even if yesterday you were the rich guy and you were a jerk and you told the guy at the bakery <laughs> to stick a muffin up his ass, yeah. right? Today, take a deep breath and start over. Mm -hmm. You can just start over like that. Exactly. What is... Um a 30 second to a minute day in the life of you. Waking up at 6.30, trying not to check the comments that we just <laughs> talked about on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. I go to the gym. The gym is the most important aspect of my day because the gym is where my brain and my body just get aligned, okay? So we get some blood flow, we get some nutrient flow, mm -hmm. we get a little bit of adrenaline out of our systems. And it's like, you've already won the day. Yeah. You woke up and you went to the gym, right? So this is so important to me. You know, you sometimes you try to text or maybe send an email. I'm not responding mm -hmm. until I get back from the gym. Everybody knows, don't mess with that. This first part of the day, it's what sets me up for success. Mm -hmm. So I've heard a lot of people that say, I like to make my bed, you know, this old military oh, yeah. thing. It's creating this early win that you can just be like, I'm a productive person. I made mm -hmm. my bed. I went to the gym, whatever it is, even if it's not fitness for you, not everyone can work out for mm -hmm. health reasons or whatever, but whatever it is, I am routinized. I have a, I have a routine that I stick to. A lot of people think that can be boring. Mm -hmm. It's not boring. It provides like the framework for you to actually have creativity and free time. Routines actually should save you time, not take mm -hmm. up all your time. Exactly. Um, so throughout the day, you're taking business calls or you're working on your book or you're doing something with the business or whatever it is. Um, how much of that day is divided into business, book, social media? How do you uh, keep that in line? And when do you have any free time if you do? But Yeah. So for me, I pack everything into Monday through Thursday and Friday is kept free for meetings. The reason for that is, is that you need a day where you're at work but you're not working. Mm -hmm. You're playing with new ideas. You're experimenting. You're in your notebook, building out your vision. Mm -hmm. You're making sure you're not screwing things up. Okay. So on Monday, I plan out my week. Every week could be slightly different, have different priority. I plan it out and I prioritize it. Okay. And on Friday, when I have no meetings, you can't call me, you can't text me, right? That's when I go over the week and I say, you did this, what, pretty great, Nick. This, you just mm -hmm. blew it off. This, we need to move this to next week. Basically, you can't get away from your main goal when you're tracking this stuff every mm -hmm. week. So yeah, this is the goal tracker that I, I share with everybody if you sign up to the yeah, newsletter. I got you. How do you think uh, you stay with the same vision, the end goal? Do you, um, I mean, how do you keep in track with the main goal, the vision? Do you do that by the email or did, when you were younger, did you have like a visionary board or did you like a manifest? Yeah. What was your way? So I think this idea of visualization is really important to get clarity on where you wanna go. Mm -hmm. like again, to start at the end, like we were talking about earlier, but I don't think it needs to be something obsessive. Now, 
I've done it obsessively. I've visualized for 30 minutes every day for about a year. Okay. And then what you find is, oh, okay, I got the vision pretty clear. You can create some times in your life where you you check in on that and make sure you still want that yeah. thing and it still makes sense. Because guess what? We're taking in new information. God forbid we change our vision. Yeah. God forbid we change our goal. It's okay to change your goal mm-hmm. if you've gotten smarter. We're not getting dumber, right? The mm-hmm. idea is we as we go through time, we're getting smarter and sharper. So if goals and visions change, it's all good. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this ten- tendency to say, well, no, no, that that wasn't my vision. That wasn't the original vision. Okay. Well, it evolved. I don't spend 30 minutes doing visualization anymore, but I did for a time. I think anyone can benefit from this to make sure you get clarity on where you want to go. This is something that people ask me all the time in the DMs, email, whatever. The difference between trading and investing is in trading, you need information that no one else has, okay? That's probably not you. In investing, you don't need to time the market. You need to have a long-term viewpoint. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to be a long-term investor than it is to be a short-term trader. I would argue that chances are you will never be a successful short-term trader, but there's a huge opportunity for you to be a long-term successful investor. Okay.